Shalom. It's a joy to be here again with you at Your Jewish Connection. I'm Rabbi Stewart, your host and teacher, and uh, we want to connect you with the Jewish identity of Jesus, the Jewish roots of your Christian faith, practical insights for everyday life, and also the amazing things that God is doing amongst the Jewish people around the world, including in the nation of Israel. Last week, we took a careful look at Pentecost, Shavuot, and uh, this week we are going to take a tour of the book of Acts to see how God opened the door for Gentiles, non-Jews, to believe in the Jewish Messiah, Jesus, and to join the Jewish followers of Yeshua, Jesus. You won't want to miss this revelation from God's Word as we look at the Scriptures through Jewish eyes. Stay tuned. The Bible is about to come alive in an exciting way. We saw last week that what we call today the church, that it all began in Acts chapter 2 with the Jewish people, 3,000 of them accepting Jesus, Yeshua, on the appointed time of the Lord, Pentecost, or Shavuot. If you missed that broadcast or any of our other broadcasts, please know that you can find them on Faith Talk Atlanta or ReachII.org, social media, websites. Just kind of do a little search and you'll be able to find it. Today I want to take that tour of the book of Acts, and I think some of the things that we're going to be sharing with you are going to surprise you. But we're going to take a careful look at scriptures. We're going to start in Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Let's open up your Bible and uh, follow along with me. But not if you're driving. Please don't open your Bible if you're driving. You know what I mean. Okay. So... Acts chapter 4, verse 4. The apostles, Peter, they're actively bringing the good news of Messiah, Yeshua, here's the context, to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And this is what happened. Many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Then in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, it says this. Day after day in the temple courts, that was the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and from house to house, you know, house to house is still an effective way for the gospel to go forth and to disciple people. We use that in our four congregations in Belarus, and we encourage and teach it. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Yeshua is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. And Acts chapter 6, verse 7, if you saw this scripture before and you understood exactly what it meant, then I want to meet you. And uh, I got two great guys that are here, Sam, who's uh, doing the audio, and Anthony, who's doing the video. They're going to buy you some pizza and wings. Right, guys? All right, they're saying, yeah. Okay, let's see if you saw this one. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Ask yourself, what is going on here? The word of God is spreading rapidly in Jerusalem, In Jerusalem, Peter and the Jewish apostles are bringing the good news to the Jewish people that worship in the temples and the Jewish people all around, in the temple rather, and the Jewish people all around the city. And it says that 5,000 just men in Acts chapter 4, then things are continuing, they're continuing to bear fruit, and in Acts 6-7 it says man, I mean, this is a fire. And that's what we want, don't we, in our communities and cities, the fire of God to burn and people's lives transformed. You know, we saw that when we moved to Belarus in 1995. 
God was moving so powerfully amongst the Jewish people and all the people moving in Belarus. We were seeing atheists, alcoholics, drug addicts, all kinds of people transformed by the love and power of the gospel of Yeshua. And so this fire was was burning, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Jewish followers of Yeshua, Messianic Jews, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. What kind of priests? There was no Catholic church then. There were no Hindus in Jerusalem at that time. It was these same Jewish priests that had handed him over to Pilate to be crucified. And many of them, as they kept seeing the love and power of Yeshua manifest through the Jewish apostles and disciples, changed their minds. They repented of their sins, and they embraced Yeshua as the Messiah, the Savior, the Messiah of Israel. Isn't this amazing? Had you ever seen that before? So, this might surprise you because, again, as I mentioned in another broadcast, oftentimes through inac- inaccurate teachings or a kind of a, a surface reading of the Bible, we get the impression that most Jewish people in the time of Jesus, they rejected him, and there were just a handful. But the fact of the matter is it was myriads. You know what the word myriads means? The word myriads means tens of thousands. And how do I know about it being myriads? Well, one way I know is I read Acts chapter 20. And Acts chapter 21, verse 20. You see, because the word of God is our authority. And then we want historical documents to support what the authority says. So the authority, the word of God says, you see, Acts 21, 20, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who believed. That's tens of thousands. And in the Jewish encyclopedia, if they didn't take it out, which I trust they didn't because I read this in more than a decade ago, it recorded that there were more than 100,000 Jewish followers of Yeshua by the end of the first century in Jerusalem and Judea alone. It is estimated Remember here in Jerusalem, we had in Acts 4, 5,000 men only. Then Acts 6, 7, priests coming to the faith, and the word was spreading rapidly. It is estimated that the Jerusalem congregation was a minimum of 20,000 members. It was the first mega congregation. And I want to submit to you that perhaps the greatest revival in the history of what we call the church occurred in the land of Israel 2,000 years ago in the first century. Tens of thousands of Jewish people were coming to faith. But what about the Gentiles? What's going on? What about Christianity? We're talking just about a Messianic Jewish movement, Jewish people following Yeshua so far, Well, if you read the Bible carefully, if you read the book of Acts carefully, you're going to see that the word Christian wasn't mentioned until Acts chapter 11. It's a good word, but it wasn't mentioned until Acts chapter 11. And it wasn't until Acts chapter 10, approximately 10 years after the ascension of Yeshua, Jesus, that the Jewish followers of Jesus understood that they were supposed to bring the gospel to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. How do I know that? It's recorded in the book of Acts, chapter 10. It's a story of Peter and Cornelius. I want to read that story to you because I want you to see that this is a very significant story for the expansion of the gospel to go beyond the Jewish people to the people of every nation under heaven. Your ancestors, if you're not Jewish, directly or indirectly. So let's take a look at this story of Peter and Cornelius. Peter, the Jewish apostle, Cornelius, was a Gentile. 
Verse 1, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing, and he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, I want you to understand what this term God-fearing or a God-fearer means. In the synagogues and in the Jewish temple worship, there were people called God-fearers. These were non-Jews who honored the God of Israel as the God of heaven and earth. Okay? So continuing in the book of Acts here, verse 3, uh, chapter 10, verse 3. One day at about 3 in the afternoon, Cornelius had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Jaffa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter, Shimon Peter, Simon Peter, the Jewish apostle. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that happened and sent them to Jaffa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large seat being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. You remember that in the Torah, God gave the Jewish people uh, the laws of kashrut, kosher. And so some of these animals here were not kosher. And Peter said, I'm not going to eat them. But God wasn't referring to animals. He was referring to people who did not yet know him, who were not yet sanctified, people like Cornelius. And so the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And this happened three times, and the sheet was taken back up to heaven. And just then... Cornelius' people came to Peter, and while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit of the Lord said to him to go, and Peter went. And we're going to pick up the, the story. Stay tuned, because this is a major event in history that changed everything. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Your Jewish Connection. We are taking a tour of the book of Acts, and we are now digging into Acts chapter 10, the story of the Jewish apostle Peter and the Gentile leader of an Italian regiment named Cornelius, who was a God-fearer, a God-fearer, again, meaning one who, who honored the God of Israel as the creator of heaven and earth, and he would worship a god pharaoh would worship in the synagogues as a non-Jewish believer in the God of Israel. And so we remember that Cornelius had a vision. Peter had a, Cornelius had an angelic uh, visitation. Peter had a vision. And uh, the Holy Spirit told Peter to go and visit Cornelius. And so we're going to pick up the story here in Acts chapter 24. And we're taking a look at this because this is a very significant event in history. Acts, Acts chapter 10, verse 24, excuse me. So the following day, Peter arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him stand up. I'm only a man myself, he said. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware 
that it is against our Torah, our law, for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure. See, that was the vision that Peter had. It wasn't about food or changing kosher laws. It was about not calling any man impure. And so Peter says, God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I sent so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. And Cornelius explained the vision to him, and then Peter began to speak in verse 34. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what, what is right. So this is an aha moment for Peter. Because up until this time, approximately 10 years after the ascension of Jesus, Yeshua, the Jewish apostles and disciples are bringing the gospel only to Jewish people, as well as Samaritans who were kind of considered half-breed Jews. So the gospel had not yet gone to non-Jews, Gentiles, people of the nations. And so Peter is now saying something very significant. He's having a revelation, a aha moment where he says, God accepts men from every nation, of course women, who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Yeshua the Messiah, who is Lord of all. And then he explains about Yeshua's ministry a little bit and that he was a witness to it. And and, uh, verse 44 is a key verse here. While this Jewish apostle Peter says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. So just like the Holy Spirit fell upon the Jewish disciples on Shavuot for Pentecost. Now Peter, the Jewish apostle who's filled with the Holy Spirit, brings the message of Yeshua by revelation. God told him to, to the Gentiles. It's like a new moment. It's like an awakening. They hadn't done this before. And to confirm that Peter's doing the right thing, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all his Gentile friends in the same way that fell on the Jewish people in Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, Shavuot. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized or immersed in water in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Why? So that he would teach them. What an amazing, amazing story. And so I want to submit to you that Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 10 is the story of a great revival amongst the Jewish people that also affected the Samaritans who, as I said, were considered half-breed kind of Jews. And then Acts chapter 10 through 28 is the story of a great revival that continued amongst the Jewish people and spread to the people of the nations, the Gentiles, the non-Jews. And I also want to submit to you that we are debtors to one another. Jews and Gentiles have a love debt to one another. God set it up that way. Our debt to you, we as Jewish people, our debt to you as the Gentile wing of the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, our debt to you is that when our rabbis and sages rejected the New Testament writings as authoritative, you preserve that for the entire world, including my Jewish people. Thank you for that. And you have a debt to the Jewish people. What is your debt to the Jewish people? The Jewish apostles and disciples often 
risked their lives. It's recorded in the book of Acts to bring the gospel to your ancestor, directly or indirectly, to bring the gospel to your ancestors that were worshiping idols and to bring them to the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth. And also, Jewish people wrote the entire Bible. And so you preserved the New Testament for us, but we wrote it for you. And it's probably accurate to say that the Bible is a Jewish book written by Jewish people, except for maybe the book of Luke and Acts, although there's question whether or not he was Jewish. So the Bible is essentially a Jewish book written f- by Jewish people, for Jewish people, and for people of every nation under heaven. And this does not make the Jewish people better than anyone else or worse than anyone else. It's just simply God's calling, God's choosing, God's plan. God gave the Jewish people a special calling. And according to Romans 11.29, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And so we're going to be discussing... uh, more about this calling in, in, uh, in the broadcasts that are coming up, but I just want to touch upon a few things right now in the last few minutes of this broadcast. You're listening to Your Jewish Connection coming to you every Saturday morning at 9.30 here on 970 Faith Talk. We're looking at the book of Acts through Jewish eyes. We're talking about the calling of God on the Jewish people. I think a great summary of this calling comes in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, verse 4 and 5. Speaking of the people of Israel, Romans 9, 4 and 5 says this, theirs is the adoption to sonship, theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law or the Torah, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Messiah, Yeshua, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. So he also, God also gave the Jewish people a calling to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the people of the nations. He also gave them a little piece of land called Israel, a land that he declared will be the homeland of his chosen Jewish people. And, you know, oftentimes through history, my people failed terribly in their calling to be God's people and to be a light to the nations. But this calling was powerfully fulfilled 2,000 years ago when the Jewish apostles and disciples were moved with compassion to bring the light of the God of Israel, the God of heaven and earth, the creator, to Gentiles who were worshiping idols and demons. This was the love of God that moved Jewish people who in times past kept themselves from idol worshiping Gentiles to keep from being polluted by their idol worship, now moved by this incredible compassion of God manifest through Yeshua and being moved in and through them, they are risking their lives to bring the good news of the living God, the God of Israel, to people who are worshiping idols made with their hands and the demonic powers behind these false gods. Much of the book of Acts records the work of God through the Jewish apostle Paul. He's also known as Rabbi Shaul. His work to bring the gospel to both Jewish people and Gentiles, the people of the nations. Tune in next week. We're going to take a look at some of the the examples of how God ministered through Paul to both Jews and Gentiles. Today, I want to close this broadcast with a prayer. Lord, 
You said the truth sets us free. I want to thank you for the truth of your word and helping us understand it better in its Jewish, cultural, and historic context, the context by which it was written. Lord, we're not simply seeking knowledge, simply to know things. We seek knowledge so that we would be more effective in your kingdom work to love people, Jewish people and all people, into the kingdom of God one at a time. Until next week, be blessed. We'll catch you on your Jewish